Hello and welcome to our cellular respiration lecture. Today we are going to be talking about the basic parts of cellular respiration. Um, there are a lot more details to this than we'll be going into. So really what I want you to get out of this lecture is a, a basic understanding of cellular respiration, the two types, and how they work. Okay. Um, the textbook and a lot of videos go into a lot more detail than we'll be going into. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. Okay, so first of all, what is cellular respiration? Cellular respiration is the process used to extract energy from food molecules for cellular, cellular use. Okay? Um, this is not breathing, um, so the biological term for breathing is not res respiring or respiration. It is instead ventilating. Okay? But it is connected to our breathing because we do breathe in oxygen that we use in cellular respiration and we breathe out carbon dioxide, which is the byproduct of cellular respiration. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. So let's focus here on this being the process used to extract energy okay, from our food. Remember food ha contains uh, chemical energy in, uh, in the form of chemical bond energy. And in particular, these carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds um, are what are really high energy, okay? And we, we eat that food to get the energy out of it, and the way we get the energy out is through this process of cellular respiration. Um, and we use it uh, to make ATP. So that chemical bond energy that's in food, we extract it through uh, cellular respiration and make ATP. And then ATP is used to drive or fund endergonic reactions in the cell. So we talked about this a little bit in the photosynthesis re um, lecture. What kind of things uh, do you need ATP for? Well, things like making new molecules to make new cells, uh, doing active transport to create and maintain concentration gradients that are required for cell function, uh, moving a cell, moving things inside a cell, and many other things. So ATP is really an, a super important molecule that is central to all organisms. So all organisms have to use some form of cellular respiration um, in order to get the energy out of the food they either make in the case of an autotroph or eat in the case of heterotrophs, which is all, all these other organisms are heterotrophs, um, in order to get ATP. And that's because all organisms use ATP for their cellular energy source. So let's talk about ATP. I've been throwing that around as if you know what it is. Um, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and this is what the molecule looks like. It's a pretty big molecule. Um, it has an adenine, that's a nitrogenous base, a ribose sugar, and three phosphate groups. So if you're paying attention and remembering what we learned about nucleotides, you'll notice that this is a nucleotide, except for that instead of only having one phosphate group, it has, um, has the three phosphate groups. Okay. Um, but this is used as a high energy molecule, but let's first parse it down a little bit. So first of all, this part right here is the adenosine portion of the molecule. Okay, so the adenine and the ribose together make up adenosine. And then this, as you might suspect, are the three phosph phosphates, so phosphate groups. So this is the triphosphate. Okay. That's a pretty unwieldy thing to write out. And so here is a shorter way to write it. Um, and just using some shapes, right? So here is the adenosine part, and here are the three phosphate groups, the triphosphates. So I said this uh, energy, this molecule is a high energy molecule, okay? So it stores a lot of energy in it. Um, you might think, okay, it must store its energy in its carbon, 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 hydrogen bonds, and that's true. These, these parts of the molecule do contain energy, but that's not actually where ATP stores its um, energy that is then used to do cellular work. Instead, that is stored in the covalent bonds uh, between phosphate groups, okay? And especially this one here, okay, but this one too. But this one is especially high energy, this last one. Okay, and the reason why is because, remember these phosphate groups, we go back here, see that how they have a little negative right here? Negative, 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 and this one should have a negative on it too. They are all highly negatively charged. Okay, so we can draw little negatives in there. Okay, and what do we remember about positives and negatives attracting? So remember, positives are attracted to negatives, 
and negatives, they're not attracted to other negatives. And instead, they are repelled. Okay? And so that means that these negative charges on the phosphate groups are actually pushing each other away. And this is very similar to if you take a couple of strong magnets, and you know magnets have um, poles, so they have a north and a south pole, or an N and an S. Um, you could equate those to being like a negative and a positive, because magnets work the same way. If you have opposites, um, then they attract. The S and the end ends of a magnet attract each other, and then you get them to stick together. But what happens if you flip one of those around so that you have like ends um, being pushed towards each other? They don't snap together. And if you don't, if you haven't played with magnets, I can't do a visual demonstration of this because I'm not doing video. But if you have a couple magnets on your fridge, you might just try this. Okay? Some will be oriented um, and snap together. Others will be oriented so their like ends are against each other. And instead of coming together, they instead repel each other. Okay? That is similar to what's going on here with these phosphate groups. Okay? They're not snapping together, they're repelling each other. And yet they are held together, right? They are held together by a covalent bond, um, but that means it is taking a lot of energy. Oh my goodness, sorry about that. It's taking a lot of energy uh, to keep those that molecule together, to keep those bonds together. Okay? Um, so this means that these bonds and in particular, it's this last one. Okay, these bonds are very unstable. That means they don't really want to be being held together. And that is equivalent to being high energy. Okay, if you could imagine that this molecule is kind of like a spring, like a really, um, a really strong spring. And in order to keep that phosphate group on, you need to add energy to it. You need to be pushing on it, right? So that means if it's having a lot of energy to hold it on there, when uh, it releases, it's also going to release a lot of energy. Okay, ATP is really unstable. It lasts for less than a second. And that last phosphate group pops off really easily because it's basically barely being held on there. It's so negatively charged. It's hanging out with other negatively charged things. It doesn't want to be there. Okay? And when the last phosphate group pops off, um, you, you suddenly get something called aden adenosine diphosphate. That's what the um, ADP stands for, because we only have two phosphate groups, plus a P, plus a phosphate group. Okay? So this guy pops off, and since that bond has a lot of energy in it to hold that bond on there, when it pops off, it releases energy. Okay? And that is how the uh, ATP molecule then gives energy to do work. Okay, so you have this high energy molecule. When the phosphate group pops off, it releases energy, and that energy is used to do things like drive um, uh, synthesis of other molecules, move things against their concentration gradient, move things alongside of skeleton tracks, all that stuff. Okay. And yet ATP is very expensive to make, right? It's this molecule, has lots of atoms in it, and it also um, has high energy bonds. So we're talking about this bond here being the most high energy, but this one is also high energy. So in order to make even this molecule here, the ADP, the cell had to put in a lot of energy. So it doesn't make sense for the cell to say dismantle this entire ADP um, and start making ATP again from scratch. Instead, it makes sense for the cell to recycle ATP okay, and, and take the ADP that was made when ATP was used to do work add some energy and regenerate the ATP. Okay. So we get this back and forth cycle between ATP, then it releases energy, that's used to do work. We've generated ADP plus a phosphate group, and then we wanna get back to making ATP. This is what cellular respiration does. Cellular respiration is all about making this ATP. Okay. And remember, where we're gonna get that energy is from our food. Okay. And we're always talking about glucose here because it's the most straightforward. Glucose um, goes directly into the process of cellular respiration. Um, I'll talk at the end a little bit about the fact that we don't eat only glucose. Um, but just remember this flow of energy, right? So we, we have the sun, energy in the sunlight, in those photons, that's captured. Um, by the plant in chemical bond energy between the carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen atoms. 
then every organism uses cellular respiration that we're going to go through today to get the energy out of those and then uses that energy to make ATP and that energy in ATP is then used to do work inside the cells. Okay. So we can trace the energy that our cells use right back to the sun. Okay. So if we didn't have the sun, we wouldn't have energy. Uh, if we didn't have plants capturing that sun, we wouldn't have energy. Here's just another way uh, to show that, right? So here's the ATP molecule. The PI is the same as a phosphate group. Okay, so you have ATP, releases energy for cells. You generate ADP plus this phosphate group. You get your energy from food, add that phosphate group back on, you're back to ATP. All right, so as we said, cellular respiration is a process used to extract energy from food to make ATP. And there are actually two forms of cellular respiration. The first is called aerobic cellular respiration. Um, this is the form uh, that requires oxygen. So that's what aerobic means. Aerobic refers to needing oxygen. So, you know, if you're doing aerobics, you're breathing a lot, you require a lot of oxygen. Okay. Um, this is the form of cellular respiration that most organisms that we're familiar with, like plants and animals, mushrooms, that kind of thing. Also protists that you might not be that familiar with because they're single celled and, ba and some bacteria use um, this form of cellular respiration. Because it is so common, um, we end up just referring to it as cellular respiration and kind of dropping the aerobic cellular respiration. Uh, so if I ever just say cellular respiration, then I'm talking about the aerobic form that requires oxygen. And this is a very efficient form of cellular respiration, much more so than the second form. Uh, the second form of uh, cellular respiration is called anaerobic cellular respiration. Anaerobic means um, that it is without oxygen. And we call this type, instead of the mouthful of anaerobic cellular respiration, usually we just call it fermentation. Okay. So these are the two names that we usually go by cellular respiration and fermentation. Cellular respiration requires oxygen. Um, eukaryotic organisms, so plants, animals, protists, and fungi are all eukaryotes. And some bacteria that are prokaryotes use this. Okay? And then there's fermentation without oxygen. Um, a lot of bacteria, so those are prokaryotes, and some yeast. Yeast are actually eukaryotes, they're a type of um, fungus uh, do fermentation or are capable of doing fermentation. Okay? And this is less efficient. And if you look back at the evolution of life on Earth, what we find is that first on Earth, uh, prokaryotes, like, the, like some of the bacteria that we, similar to organisms, uh, similar to bacteria that we still have around today, evolved first and evolved this ability to do anaerobic cellular respiration or fermentation to get uh, food molecules out of the environment and make ATP. It wasn't that efficient though and pretty soon along came um, some prokaryotes, some bacteria that evolved the ability to do uh, photosynthesis and they made oxygen. Okay? You actually can see this in the, um, in the geological record because when that happened and a whole bunch of these uh, photosynthetic bacteria came about on Earth they flooded the um, environment or our atmosphere with oxygen and that caused all of the rocks that had iron in them to oxidize or rust and become red and you can see when you dig down in certain places in the earth this really this distinct layer of red oxidized um, rocks and that's from that and we find it all over the globe so that's one reason why we know that happened now we had this environment that was full of oxygen that allowed aerobic cellular respiration to evolve. And because it was more efficient, it was selected for, right? it had a selective advantage because it, those organisms could get more energy out of their food or out of the environment. Um, and, um, and so now we see that most organisms on earth use this form. Okay, so we're gonna spend probably most of our time talking about, um, oops, I didn't want that there, I want that here, aerobic cellular respiration. And then at the end, we'll talk about anaerobic cellular respiration. All right, so do you remember when we talked about photosynthesis, we went through a general overall chemical equation for photosynthesis? Well, here's the same thing, but for aerobic cellular respiration. And similarly to photosynthesis, um, this belies the fact that this is a multi-step process um, with high complexity. This just boils it down 
to the major inputs. So these are the inputs. And these are the outputs or the products. Okay. Notice that we are starting with glucose. Okay, and this is aerobic, so we're also starting with oxygen here. Okay. And then we go through this process of cellular respiration that's signified by this little arrow here. And we get out ATP, right? That ATP is the whole point of this process. Okay? This water and carbon dioxide, those are byproducts. Okay? And here's a little diagram that shows how they're connected to breathing. Okay, so we breathe in oxygen, it goes into our lungs, goes into our, our blood, um, goes, in, goes down to our muscles, um, and into our cells, mitochondria, we haven't talked about yet, but we will in just a second. Um, and that produces water and carbon dioxide. Okay, the car and, and we're taking sugar from the food. Okay, the carbon dioxide then goes and gets breathed back out. Okay, so I do want you to notice that cellular respiration and photosynthesis are related to each other. So how are they related? So this up here, this is showing cellular respiration, and this here is showing photosynthesis. Okay, and hopefully what you can see is that the inputs for cellular respiration, so I'm gonna say cellular respiration right here, and I'll say well, photo sin here for photosynthesis. The inputs for cellular respiration are the outputs for photosynthesis. Okay? So um, in cellular respiration, we take the sugars and the oxygen that are produced, produced during photosynthesis and use them in cellular respiration to make ATP and carbon dioxide and water. Okay? This carbon dioxide and water then goes back into photosynthesis right? uh, and, fun and makes that happen. So these two things go hand in hand and I guess green's okay. And the only thing that's different is where the energy is, right? So in cellular respiration, um, we're taking the energy that was in the glucose and putting it into ATP, okay? And in um, photosynthesis, we're taking the energy that was in the sunlight and putting it into glucose, and then that goes and make ATP, right? So if you're following the energy, um, the energy is in the sunlight, right? And then the energy is in the glucose, and then the energy is in the ATP. Um, so these really go with each other, okay, and for organisms such as ourselves that can't do photosynthesis, then we are reliant upon those photosynthetic organisms to produce glucose and oxygen so that we can do cellular respiration. And again, glucose here, we're standing really in for a general food, okay, and of course we don't eat only glucose, that would not be healthy, um, but other molecules uh, that we do eat also feed into cellular respiration. If you're an autotroph, um, you make your own food and do your own cellular respiration, so you're really not reliant on anybody else. So that means if all the heterotrophs died off, the autotrophs, they would be fine and happy, they would keep living. Um, but if, uh, if we, our world lost the autotrophs, then the heterotrophs would be in big trouble because we wouldn't get any of this, right? And that means we couldn't do this and we wouldn't get energy and we also wouldn't get um, anything for ourselves to use. Alrighty, so let's talk a little more, more about aerobic cellular respiration. So first of all, where does it occur? So that we're talking about in eukaryotes. So um, there are some organisms that are not eukaryotes that do cellular respiration, but they don't do it in their mitochondria. Okay, so eukaryotes do cellular respiration in their mitochondria, and that's what this is showing here. Here's a little, here's a mitochondrion, okay? Most cells have multiple mitochondria. And here's a plant cell. Plant cells also have mitochondria. Um, and this is an up close diagram of a mitochondria. And just like we needed to know the um, we needed to know the anatomy of a chloroplast to understand it, having an understanding of the anatomy of a mitochondrion also helps. Okay, so they have a double membrane. These membranes are phospholipid bilayers, just like all membranes inside cells. On the very inside, this part here is called the matrix, okay? and then they have this inner membrane, and then there's uh, an outer membrane and some space in between that. It's called the inner membrane space. 
And then prokaryotes or bacteria, when they do aerobic cellular respiration, um, and anaerobic for that matter, it just occurs in the cytoplasm, right? Because they don't have mitochondria at all. Okay, so cellular respiration, aerobic cellular respiration, so we are talking about aerobic cellular respiration here, um, is a three-step process or three stages. First is glycolysis, and then the Krebs cycle, and then uh, something called the electron transport chain, or ETC, and chemiosmosis. Okay, so we're going to go through each one of these and talk about what happens, and then um, also talk about how they are connected to each other. And remember, the whole point is to make ATP, right? So try not to lose track of that fact as we go through this. Okay, so glycolysis um, occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell, so it doesn't actually occur in the mitochondrion. It is a multi-step process, um, and we're, again, we're not going through all those steps. If you're curious about them, you can definitely look at the diagram in your book, but you are not required to know all those single steps there. One thing that is interesting to note is that, um, remember how we talked about enzymes uh, being very specific for the type of reaction that they can catalyze? So if you look at your diagram um, in your book, and you'll see all these, multi all these steps within the the process of glycolysis, every step has its own enzyme. So that's interesting to think about. But what I really want you to know is this, what the purpose is. So the purpose is to prepare glucose for the Krebs cycle by breaking it into two molecules um, called pyruvate. Okay, so we're going to start out with glucose. It's going to go through this multi-step process that we're just going to put in one and say glycolysis, and you get out of that two pyruvate molecules. Okay, essentially what's happening is that the glucose is being chopped in half. Remember, glucose has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, okay? And then and when it gets chopped in half and the atoms get rearranged, we really haven't lost anything. We still have our six carbons. They are just now distributed into two different molecules. Okay? The pyruvate then is going to move into the Krebs cycle. This process is exergonic, meaning anytime you break some bonds, it releases energy, and so the cell does capture some energy in ATP, okay, this is only two ATP, um, and this ATP is just used immediately by the cell. Remember um, that ATP only lasts less than a second, right? So once it's made during glycolysis, it has less than a second for the cell to use it. Okay? So the cell has to constantly be generating new um, ATP molecules in order to continue to do work. Oh no, here's an interesting little fact I forgot to say. Um, you actually generate your body weight in ATP molecules every day. Okay, so that means that you go through that much ATP that it, it's as much as you weigh, right? And we're talking about a little tiny atom, you know, molecule here. Um, so that means, you know, you go through a lot of ATP in a given day. So you have to be constantly generating it, which is why you also need to eat, right? Or if you do a lot of physical exertion, you'll be hungrier because you're using up more of your body's energy. All right, so during glycolysis, uh, we, the, we have broken our glucose into two molecules of pyruvate, and we got some ATP out of it. Those are the main things that happen. Okay, and then next is our second thing is the Krebs cycle. And this actually occurs in the mitochondria. It occurs in this inner area called the matrix in this area here, okay? So that means the pyruvate has to move into that area, which it does. And this again is a complex series of reactions, okay? Um, and it is called a cycle uh, because the um, uh, enzymes that carry out this complex series of reactions are recycled or used over and over again. Um, and the purpose is to extract the energy from the carbon-carbon bonds of pyruvate, right? So remember these bonds here? They're high energy, right? Also the carbon-hydrogen bonds that would be going between this carbon and the hydrogens um, also have energy. Okay, so we're gonna, during the Krebs cycle, we're gonna get the energy out of that. Okay. So when the carbon-carbon bonds are broken, energy is released and captured. So if you break this, it's gonna release some energy. Okay, if you break that, it's gonna release some energy. And that energy is used to make glucose, or make ATP. Okay, this ATP, just like the ATP that was made during glycolysis, is used immediately. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so that's 
confused immediately. Um, and the other energy that is captured, so remember only some of it's captured by ATP, most of the energy is shuttled to step three, which is um, the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis and used to make a lot more ATP. Okay. So basically what's happening during the Krebs cycle um, is both molecules of pyruvate, so remember there are two, they're going to enter the Krebs cycle and they're going to turn out some ATP and a bunch will be captured by these high energy um, electron shuttles, if you're interested to know, and carried over to that last step. Okay. And then additionally, carbon dioxide is generated, right? So if you break off a carbon, that's going to mean release a carbon, um, and that comes off as carbon dioxide, that is a waste gas, and that's what we breathe out. Okay. So here's the Krebs cycle. Notice that we haven't used oxygen yet, right? So here we're generating carbon dioxide, but we haven't actually used oxygen yet. Okay, so both pyruvate from glycolysis, so this would be coming from glycolysis, go into the Krebs cycle. Okay, and the Krebs cycle, it's a cycle, and I'm just showing it here as a, a you know, circle with arrows. There's multi-steps in this, and if, if this is too simplistic for you, um, then you can by all means go to your book or look online uh, to look at the, uh, something more specific if you're not really understanding how this works in this more simple way. Um, some people like more detail, it helps them understand it. Some people like less detail, that's what helps them understand it. So I'm trying to, trying to kind of do both here. Okay, so this molecule is going to go through this Krebs cycle during that. Remember those carbon-carbon bonds are going to be broken, okay, and that's going to release energy. Okay, some energy is captured by a little bit of ATP, two ATP or not that many ATP, okay. Um, in order to make the ATP, we take some adenosine diphosphate and phosphate group and add them together and get ATP. Okay. Um, and carbon dioxide comes off as those carbons are released. And then this is the most important point here is that the, a lot of energy is captured and it is shuttled to electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. That's step three. Okay. So by the end of the Krebs cycle, um, the only a little bit of um, energy has been extracted from that original glucose. Um, we've made two ATP in glycolysis and two ATP in the Krebs cycle, so that's only four total. And most of the energy is um, held in these molecules and taken over to the last step, okay, which is the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. And this again is a complex series of steps, like they all are, okay. And it occurs at proteins that are on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Okay, so that's this here, right? This area. This is the inner mit. This is the inner membrane. Okay, and see how it has all these infoldings in it? That's because these proteins that do this last part of cellular respiration, that are really uh, essential for churning out a whole bunch of ATP, uh, reside here. Okay, and so if there's more um, surface area of the membrane, that means more proteins can be added to it, okay? And so this is what this diagram is trying to show, that we're talking about this area here, okay? And I'm going to represent it with this um, diagram. That's supposed to be the um, phospholipid bilayer, okay? And remember I said it occurs at proteins in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, okay? So the electron transport chain, or ETC proteins, are located here, and that's a series of three membrane proteins that are embedded in the membrane. Okay, and then there's an enzyme, uh, which is also a protein, remember, called ATP synthase. Okay, and ATP synthase is what really churns out the ATP. Okay, so the purpose of the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis um, is to use that energy that was captured in the Krebs cycle from the carbon-carbon bonds of pyruvate to churn out or make a whole bunch of ATP. Um, so the electron transport chain receives energy from the Krebs cycle and it transfers that energy through a series of complex processes that you, if you want to look in your book or if you want to talk to me about it later, I'd be happy to, but we're just going for simple here, um, transfers the energy to ATP synthase and then ATP synthase uh, makes 32 ATP for every glucose that went into it way back at the start. So a lot more, right? Remember in glycolysis, we just made two ATP, Krebs cycle, two more ATP. Now when we get to the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis, ATP synthase 
uses most of that energy that was captured from the, that original glucose molecule um, that went into glycolysis and turns out a bunch more ATP. And then this is also where oxygen is made. So oxygen um, is made by the electron transport or used by the electron transport chain um, and it makes water. Okay, so that's where oxygen goes in and water comes out. Okay. And the oxygen is important because it keeps the electron transport chain going. So that energy is constantly provided to ATP synthase for uh, ATP synthase to do its job of making ATP. Okay, so here's our summary. Okay, here's glycolysis. Okay, and what I forgot to show here is that to make two ATP, you're going to also have to have two ADP plus two phosphate groups, and that will go into glycolysis and come out as two ATP, right? So we started with glucose, we have two pyruvates and some ATP, okay? Those pyruvates, each one of them is going to go through the Krebs cycle on its own, okay? It's going to generate carbon dioxide, two more ATP, and then here a bunch of the energy is going to be captured and shuttled over to, um, this is the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis, okay? The energy is given to the electron transport chain through this complex series of reactions. It transfers the energy to ATP synthase, which then takes a whole bunch of ADP and phosphate group, sticks them together, and makes 32 ATP. Okay. So as you can see, where, where is the most ATP made during this process? During which step? Clearly, over here in the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. Okay. And here's just a little accounting that. So notice that we're always talking about this number of ATP, oops, sorry, uh, per glucose, okay? And that's because we're thinking about the glucose that enters here, right? So here's one glucose coming out. We make two ATP, four ATP, and, thir and, um, and then plus 32 is 36. All right. Okay, so in glycolysis, we make two ATP per glucose, Krebs cycle, two ATP, electron transport chain, 32 for a total of 36. Now, do I really care that you know exactly how many are made during glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain chemiosmosis? No, I don't actually care um, for the exact numbers, but you should know the relative amount, relative amount, right? So the most is made here, okay? And this is just a little ATP made and a little ATP made here, okay? And it's really here in the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis where the majority of the electron trans, uh, where majority of the ATP is created. And that's really what I want you to know. Okay, and then of course, we don't all only just eat sugars or glucose, right? Or even carbohydrates, right? Because if you start with starch, your body can easily, um, your body can easily chop glucose molecules off of the starch and put it into glycolysis. You know, and this is the main pathway uh, definitely remember when we talked about carbohydrates, we said that um, monosaccharides and disaccharides and even carbohydrates like starches um, and glycogen uh, provide energy for the body, right? I said that monosaccharides and disaccharides provide um, immediate energy use for your body. And that's because that is the most straightforward pathway um, into making um, ATP, so when it says energy down here, it means ATP, okay? But of course we eat other things, we eat fats and we eat proteins, okay? The fats are broken apart and entered into um, cellular respiration into different parts, okay? So we didn't talk about the linking step, we just, we basically put the linking step into glycolysis together into one thing. So you can kind of think about it that way, won't worry about the details, but the idea here is that the fats are broken down into their fatty acid tails and the glycerol head and those enter into uh, cellular respiration at slightly different points, okay? And then with the proteins, um, they're usually broken apart. The amino groups, um, because the nitrogen is kind of hard to come by, those are usually just reused and not digested and got the energy out there, kept and used to make um, more proteins or excreted as waste. But the carbon part, uh, can enter into various parts depending on the protein um, into glycolysis or into the Krebs cycle. Okay. But the point is that everything that you eat one way or another goes through cellular respiration and makes um, makes ATP. Okay. All right, so we just went through um, 
aerobic cellular respiration, and now we're going to talk about anaerobic cellular respiration, or remember that's called fermentation. Okay. So remember, we're now talking about uh, cellular respiration without oxygen, okay? And this is done by bacteria, some bacteria and some yeast. Okay. It is less efficient, but when you're a little tiny single-celled organism, it could be enough for you. Okay, so there's actually two types of fermentation. They um, have this in common that they both produce ATP by glycolysis only. That means they don't do the Krebs cycle, they don't do the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. They're only going to use glycolysis. Okay, remember glycolysis, if you remember back how many ATP does it make, it makes two. Right? So if you're an organism that does fermentation, you're only ever going to make two ATP for the, every glucose molecule that you take in. Right? So, like I said, that's much less efficient, right? If you are doing aerobic cellular respiration, then you can make 36. And then they also both make um, byproducts that are really useful for human food production, which is basically why we're that interested in them. Okay? There's lactic acid fermentation, and there's also alcoholic fermentation. So let's talk about lactic acid fermentation first. Lactic acid fermentation is performed by um, different types of bacteria. Okay. and lactic acid is the byproduct. Okay, so for lactic acid fermentation, uh, we're going to start out with glucose and gl go through glycolysis. Okay, and here are those two ATP that are made. We still make pyruvates, and then the pyruvates are further broken down into something called lactic acid. So this is lactic acid. Okay, notice this is has three carbons and these have three carbons, right? So we haven't actually lost any carbons. So we have just made ATP and lactic acid. So for the organism, the whole point of this was to make ATP, right? For humans, the point is to make this lactic acid. So if you're using some sort of lactic acid bacteria, um, lactic acid fermentation bacteria, you are wanting them to make lactic acid. Um, and that is because they're important for making foods that we like, like yogurt and actually cheeses, sauerkraut, kimchi, um, some kind of meats um, that are fermented. A lot of the foods that we eat use uh, fermentation, right? And so here's some, right? So here's, this is on the back of a yogurt container. Uh, lactobacillus acidophilus, uh, ooh, I can't remember what, the, what genus that is, but thermophilus. Um, there's uh, several types of bacteria that can do um, lactic acid fermentation for us. And this actually, it does a couple things for us. Why do we like fermented foods? Well, for one thing, um, it is a way to preserve our food. So lactic acid is an acid, and it actually kills off bacteria. Um, so it, it prevents the other bacteria from you know, getting into the food or also uh, any sort of molds or that kind of thing and preventing, you know, break, <laughs> it prevents other things from invading it and breaking down the food and spoiling it, okay? It also, the fermentation can break down the sugars that are in the food. So take, for example, milk. When you put uh, lactic acid bacteria in there and they ferment it, they break down the lactose, okay? They break down the lactose into glucose and galactose. And that's something that some people can't do themselves, right? Some people are lactose intolerant. So some people who are lactose intolerant can still eat something like yogurt or cheese that's been highly fermented so that the bacteria have used up all of the, that sugar and then they can eat it because it doesn't have those sugars left in it. Okay. Lact the lactic acid also makes that tangy thing, you know, so if, um, if you make yogurt yourself or don't put a lot of sugar in your yogurt, then it's really tangy and that's from the lactic acid. Um, also, the some byproducts of fermentation um, can make some vitamins uh, that are good for us as well. Okay. And then the other type of fermentation is called alcoholic fermentation. Okay, this is performed by yeast, which are a type of fungus. Okay? And the byproducts are ethanol, which is also called alcohol, and carbon dioxide. Okay? So here we still have the same glycolysis, so hopefully you'll notice that for both aerobic cellular respiration, lactic acid fermentation, and alcoholic fermentation, this first step is exactly the same, right? We start with glucose, we go through glycolysis, get out two pyruvates, and two ATP. Okay, in alcoholic fermentation, that pyruvate um, is then changed into ethanol. Okay, ethanol is alcohol. 
um, and it has two carbons. So in order to do this change from pyruvate to ethanol, some carbon dox or a carbon is released, like one of these bonds is broken, um, and that releases carbon dioxide into the air or in, into the area surrounding the, uh, the yeast. So there's the yeast, okay? We like these guys because they help us make beer and bread and wine and also any distilled uh, spirits like vodka or whiskey, all that kind of stuff is relying upon alcoholic fermentation, okay? When we make beer, um, of course, the alcohol is kept in there, right? That's why we drink it. Um, and also the carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide gives it fuzziness, okay? When we use it to make bread, um, the, the carbon dioxide is what makes the bread rise, so it's the leavening agent. As the yeast uh, digests the starch that's in the flour, um, they, make, they give off carbon dioxide bubbles, or give off carbon dioxide and that creates little bubbles and that makes the bread rise. Okay? It also makes ethanol or alcohol, uh, but when you bake the bread, that, um, that evaporates off. So when you're eating bread, you're not eating alcohol. When you're eating, drinking something like wine or like a, say vodka or some kind of distilled spirit that is not bubbly, um, what they've done is, you know, um, given the yeast some grapes to consume, they make the carbon dioxide and the alcohol, the carbon dioxide is let off. Um, so it's not kept in the product and just the ethanol is kept. All right, and that, there is our journey through um, cellular respiration, both aerobic cellular respiration and alcoholic, uh, sorry, <laughs> both aerobic cellular respiration and anaerobic.